Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and we have with us Vice Admiral Mike Shoemaker, who is the commander of U.S. Naval Air Forces. Sir, thanks very much for taking time with us. Um, extraordinary time for naval aviation, as you said in your talk uh, just now. Virtually every uh, naval aircraft, except for the nuclear support forces, are undergoing modernization. Um, and one of the things I wanted to start off is that there still is a sense that the Navy is very, very skeptical about the F-35. Mm -hmm. Even though I just got off of GW right. and DT-3, the development, uh, the phase three of the developmental testing that's going aboard, the qualification of the first batch of operational Navy pilots, there's still this sort of lingering sense that the Navy isn't fully aboard the F-35. Um, how can you lay those to rest and why is this important? Why is this jet important to the future of naval aviation? Uh, so first off, I think if you had a chance to talk to any of the pilots from um, VFA 101 that were out there that are flying it now regularly, they, um, they love the airplane. Um, and I think as we've had an opportunity to integrate it with our, um, with our smart guys in Fallon, um, we're learning that this is, uh, this is a, a platform that brings some incredible capabilities. Not just, you know, we understand low observable, penetration, ability to, to, to get deep into environments where our current air aircraft couldn't, couldn't go. But as they look at what, from a, from a, um, a fusion of, of data, the ability to sense the environment both actively and passively, put it all together, give a coherent picture to both the F-35 and all the other partner aircraft, both strike group or um, air wing, strike group and joint. Um, I think that's where the true value of this fifth generation fighter will, will be. Um, you know, the, I think we just need to, need to get it to the fleet to have guys really appreciate it and have those young, when those guys get on the road and take that to, Nor to Fallon or to Oceana or to Lemoore and do the dog and pony shows, there's a lot of excitement in the, in the, among the JOs that are flying Super Hornets and Legacy Hornets right now. So um, we, it's a platform we need. We needed it years ago. Otherwise, you know, we're kind of struggling through our legacy challenges right now. Um, there were obviously reasons why we haven't gotten it there, both resourcing, funding, and some developmental pieces to it uh, that have delayed it. But I think we're on a good path right now for the IOC in Lemoore in, um, in late 2018. And we're going to keep pushing to get this airplane to the, to the fleet as soon as we can. We, we need it now. How much work have you put into how you integrate this jet with fourth generation jets and as you guys define it, sort of the 4.5 version of the Hornet that you're gonna be transitioning to? So that's, I mentioned the integration up at Fallon. A couple of detachments already where they've taken four ships of um, F-35 up um, and work with Growlers, with Rhino. Um, we haven't worked in E2D yet, that's the next piece, but I think that will be critical as we develop the kind of the, TT, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of how to best employ this, uh, and I'll call it a niche capability, because I, you know, I don't think this will be an airplane you send to do close air support, load it up with a bunch of racks. I mean, it's going to be, you know, have to watch the way we operate it, because I want to not do it like we did with Legacy Hornets and fly, uh, put lots of hours on the platform when we can do, do things in it um, uh, and practice things in the simulator, in a virtual environment. I've mentioned that in the talk about um, the, the need to do that because of our range space electromagnetic med, magnetic spectrum in Fallon. Um, but I think, and we've got the, the ability to do that. Probably, you know, half the mission set will be done in the simulator just because, you know, as we practice, and then we'll integrate that with our fourth and fifth gen. So we're still working on the best way. Air Force has had F-22 out for a while. They just IOC'd their alpha version of the F-35. Um, we've operated with those two um, those two fifth generation platforms in numerous exercises with our growlers. So there's lots of things we're learning that we'll bring to the, the eventual integration of, of, um, of Lightning twos. And, and that's something that uh, Rear Admiral Trigger Kelly is working on, is going to be working on when he transitions from Carrier Strike Route 12. We had a great talk with him aboard the, aboard the boat. Um, have you decided what the mix is going to be between the naval aircraft, the Charlies, and the Bravos, right now the Navy has a block by. Right. Have you defined that a little bit in working with Dog Davis? So um, he's the only one buying Bravos, obviously, as you know. Um, from a Charlie perspective, um, right now we have a, a signed TAC air integration uh, memo between the two of us that Marine Corps will provide um, a small number of squadrons to augment our air wings. To, so we have a full um, 36 strike fighters if we end up with four air, if nine air wings, you know, additional ones if we, if we keep 10 around. Um, but we've signed a plan as well as we start transitioning those initial squadrons that will start Navy. We'll start, we'll go Navy, Marine Corps, Navy, Marine for the first six. Um, and that will probably get us through the middle of 2000, of, of, of about to 2025. So um, after that, we'll see he's, he has a requirement or a need for, for four um, squadrons. Um, there's an UDP piece that he'll do, the um, um, uh, unit deployment mm -hmm. program. 
um, to augment shore-based forces. But the, the initial group, I think, will be envisioning integrating on under our carriers. And as I said, that air wing in 2025, the ones we'll integrate will be, you know, a, a squadron of 10 Super Hornets, so still a, a quarter of the air wing. So three quarters Rhino, probably until we get out to, um, you know, maybe 2030 when we start to see the one-third, two-thirds you mentioned. Um, some critics still look at the Navy's interest in F-18s as resistance to the F-35, and there are those who say, uh, even naval aviation friends of mine, that we're, the Navy is causing a strike fighter shortfall, uh, for example, by designating some aircraft to do the tanking mission, and that really we're, you know, the Navy is in, the, in an industrial base call to try to support a company that it's been close to and to try to build up uh, as much reserve aircraft as possible, possible in, this, in, this, in this phase. Um, why do you need more F-18s? You know, how do you respond to that criticism? And why do you still need more F-18s at a time when increasingly there are folks saying that you, the Navy really has to transition to the fifth generation aircraft? Yeah, so, um, so I look at the, I mentioned the mix of that air wing as we move forward here and how we're buying F-35s. Um, and when I look at the, the midlife overhaul, the service life extension that has to happen on Rhinos, we have to get every one of our Super Hornets to nine or 10,000 hours in order to, to get ourselves through not just F-35, but to whatever that next generation air dominance is. That's enough airplanes to get us through probably the middle of, you know, the, of, of the 2030s. So, and then as we work through that, that midlife um, extension process, service life extension, a number of airplanes will go out of reporting. Um, and we're getting closer to that point um, as we fly rhinos today given the utilization we're putting on those airframes so we have to we have to make sure we've got sufficient numbers of airplanes tails so that when we do the 20 25 30 percent I'm not sure where that will be for out of reporting that we still have sufficient numbers to man our air wings um, through you know 2025 and beyond uh, if we don't do that and don't manage it right we won't have uh, we'll make ourselves irrelevant from an air wing perspective um, the so the so there's a and, and I mentioned in the in the talk there the what the Rhino the partnering of Rhino and Lightning II is absolutely critical when you when you pair up a high low mix number one it's it's more affordable um, number two you look at the capabilities and where you would use those things you allows the Rhino to be sort of the the platform that carries things while the F uh, F thirty five does the kind of the the builds the picture gives the targeting information the long range long range ID that I talked about. Um, so there's a, I'm, I'm excited that that's our plan moving forward, and we can't neglect the Super Hornet piece to it, but we need to bring, and, we, and, and in this environment, it's a challenge to kind of balance both of those, but we need them both as part of our future air wing. Uh, but there are those, for example, who look at the Navy's um, long-range unmanned, you know, you were talking about the future, right? Um, the U-class program, the X-47, was supposed to pave the way for this sort of joint strike ISR jet for the future, which, which Navy strategists have said. The, the carrier's fundamental challenge right now is a short, all the aircraft are too short range. You, know, you need something that can reach out and touch somebody far deeper. Uh, and there were those who were surprised that the MQ-25 plan is really effectively to make it an ISR and tanking uh, aircraft. Um, how do you respond to those folks who say that the, the Navy is in danger of making the carrier, uh, undermining the relevance of the carrier by not equipping it with jets that have the range and stealth to be day one and to be able to push the carrier far offshore and get it out of the range of DF-21, DF-26, and some of these other systems? Um, so first off, I would say the, um, um, the, the, and Tommy Roden, my counterpart, the swell boss, talks about this all the time, the shift from a power projection Navy to a sea control Navy. Um, we've had the luxury after the Soviets went away years ago to transition, we, to, to operate in environments where we didn't have to worry about sea control. We've done it, you know, we do it in the, in the Fifth Fleet. Uh, it's not nearly as demanding as what I would see in the Western Pacific. Um, but as we look at that sea control fight, and I look at what we have from an air wing perspective, integrated air wing, the range of our current platforms, the, the, uh, the weapons that we're bringing on, um, you know, difficult to talk in an unclass about, you know, the, the vulnerability or the, the range and reach when I know things are coming online that allow us to reach out and touch, you know, things well beyond the range of the of the air wings of the past, and I and I got the the, the frustrations in some folks as they do the analysis. But those were airplanes that flew a little farther, but were essentially over top of targets when they dropped, or a little bit of standoff. Now we're with our ability to to do combat ID at range, to have weapons that go out and reach farther. I think the reach of the air wing um, far exceeds where it was in the past. Um, and as we move in, you talk about first day of the strike, uh, or first day of the war strikes. Um, I'll go back to, to 
what Admiral Swift talks about out there. It's, it's a maritime AOR. You've got to do the sea control piece first before you ever get into power projection. And I think we, the way we'll operate and kind of create the sanctuaries and kind of roll back, um, we'll be in a position where we can, not day one of the war, because there's lots of things we've got to worry about from a sea control fight before we jump into the power projection fight. I think we're going to be optimized for sea control, um, and I think we're going to have the ability to reach out with the combination of airplanes and weapons to do the power projection. Maybe not on day one because we've got to work through the other challenges of the contested environment. Do you, um, what, how does that shape your thinking of what the aircraft after next, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk about the sixth generation jet. Uh, even Navy friends of mine tell me, hey, let's get the fifth generation jet under our belt to, to try to build this, this future plan. But what do you see, what's the aircraft or the system you see that may be needed as you look out to the 2020s and 2030s? Um, well, that's a great question. They're in the middle of that whole next generation air dominance um, analysis of alternatives, or at least looking at the initial, what we think it ought to be. And uh, as I said in, in the in the talk this morning, I'm getting a brief with um, Ever Miller tomorrow. Um, but I think there'll be a, you know, I think we'll learn more once we get F-35 to the fleet in terms of the value of LO and stealth. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that say new things are coming on, you know, radar, different kinds of radars that will that will make that less um, less important. And I and, and I think there what we're seeing is that that may be the case as you start just initial detections. But I th think as you start flying into envelopes um, and supporting with other assets, um, that um, that LO stealth is important as you start moving down from just um, search radars to actual radars that have to target and engage you with other weapon systems. That's right, because you have to look at the full chain, right? It's not just yeah. detection, but it's actually getting Absolutely. all the way to prosecution. So they may detect you, but you know, now, now they've got to get a, you know, get a shot off. Um, so I, you know, I think as we look at next generation air dominance for that sixth generation, there's things we still need to learn from fifth gen, and then also from man done man, because I think that will be one of the big conversations is, do you bring something on um, that is manned at sixth generation? Do you need a man in the loop? So uh, there's lots we need to learn still as we shape what that, um, that follow-on to essentially Rhino will be.